Hi everyone, welcome back this week. Now, last Thursday, I was on Dr. Bean's channel and had a great discussion about the Pfizer COVID-19 drug, okay, Paxlovid. Now, if you haven't watched that video, I highly encourage you to watch that video first, because in this video, I'm going to do a little bit detailed follow-up on this drug, and as well as discussing a new question, is the potential second booster for all adults. Now, this video is going to be a little bit different than my usual videos with me uh, doing a little bit more talking and also give out a little bit more opinion based on some facts that I can find on internet and as well as on published data and as well as statements. Now, so before we dive into the topics, let's have a little bit understanding of what evidence-based medicines is. Now this topic or this title is something all medically related personnel and professions need to learn and pass in schools. So the most straightforward definitions about evidence-based medicine I can find was from the National Cancer Institution website. Now basically it said evidence-based medicine is a systematic approach to medicine using the best available scientific evidence from clinical research to help make decisions about care of individual patients. And in addition to clinical research, a physician's clinical experience is also very important and also need to take in considerations of patients' values as part of the decision-making process. Now, in other words, treatments need to be a combination of clinical research data and as well as physician's clinical experience before making a decision. Now, let's look at the Paxlovid EUA uh, web it was first authorized by the FDA back in late December 2021. Now the drug was indicated for the treatment of mild to moderate COVID-19 in adults and pediatric patients 12 and up at least 40 kilograms or 88 pounds who are at risk okay, for progression to severe COVID-19, including hospitalizations and deaths. Now, this authorizations include both vaccinated and unvaccinated individuals. Now, but at that time, the only evidence available of the drug's effectiveness was actually only based on clinical trials of unvaccinated adults with risk factor and basically, in this population, the drug can significantly reduce uh, COVID-related hospitalizations or death by 88% compared to the placebo. So what about evidence of Paxlovid used in vaccinated people with risk and also in people with standard risk? Now, no one really exactly know how well Paxlovid works in vaccinated individuals until a press release that was released on June 14th, which is about six months after its initial EUA. <clears throat> so what did it say? Now, here is some uh, footnote, okay? Basically, it says data from standard risk patients, both vaccinated and unvaccinated, it's not significant, okay? And also in a subgroup analysis, things are also not significant. Non-significant 57% reduction in hospitalizations and death observed in Paxlovid treated vaccinated patients with at least one risk factor for severe COVID-19. The detail is that patients with standard risk did not all report a sustained alleviation of all symptoms for four days. And it only had about a 70% non-significant relative risk reduction in hospitalizations or death. Now notice that both the treatment arms and placebo arms had a little more than 400 patients only. This is incredibly small study and the result was not 
significant, and that's the most important part. Now they follow up with an updated analysis with about 150 more patients in both arms, but again the reduction is non-significant, only about 51 percent relative risk reduction. And a finally, a subgroup analysis of 721 vaccinated adults with at least one risk factor for severe COVID-19, again, at a non-significant 50% relative risk reduction in hospitalizations or death. Now, here are two problems, small sample size and as well as non-significant differences. Now, I have never seen any other drugs that are approved or authorized or could be marketed with such data. Now, throughout the last two years, there have been many other drugs that people are trying to do repurpose study, okay, and try to hopefully find proof saying that it can treat COVID. Now, of all those studies, the critics are always saying the study were small, the um, significance difference were not there. So, so far we have none. We only have one oral treatment from Pfizer and as well as one oral treatment from Merck. Now, no, notice that this studies by Pfizer, they have pretty small sample size. And again, the findings for vaccinated people using this drug were not quite significant. Hmm. Well, so the problem is that when you are saying other drug for repurposing have such a problem such as small size, uh, small sample size, and as well as uh, a non-significant differences, Pfizer appears to be doing very similar things with their drug here. So I'm not sure how the officials could be measuring Paxlovid and other drugs with the same standard. Now, another thing about Paxlovid is that it was authorized in people 12 years old with um, risk factor and as well as meet the minimum weight standard. So do we know how well it worked at that time? We didn't know and we still don't know. And here is the reason. Now let's look at it. Now Pfizer here on this page here, on March 9th, they said they just starting, they're just starting initiate phase two and three study of this drug in pediatric participants. Now, which is again, many months after the initial authorizations granted by the FDA. Now, in fact, the decision from the FDA was only based on some pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamic modelings of the drug concentrations in pediatric patients and compared to adult patients and think it should work pretty much the same. Well, now I have to say that the virus is in the cells and in the tissues and this drug is to need to penetrate the cells and work on a viral protein. So the drug concentration in blood may not necessarily directly correlate to tissue penetrations. And there's a lot of different uh, small details involved in this type of um, you know, extrapolations. So, uh, I mean, is that enough evidence, okay, to make the decision for authorizing this drug for pediatric patients even before clinical trials? So, in fact, now let's look at this web page here. Here is um, the University of um, Buffalo, University at the Buffalo, anyway, University at Buffalo. They just started, okay, recruiting patients um, in June. And another university, Rugla University, is recruiting or was recruiting participants for the Paxlovid drug. And this was back in sometime in May 12. Now, so the FDA actually gave this pediatric EUA before phase two, three, and only based on pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamic data. Here is an article written by Dr. Eric Rubin. Now, for those of you who don't know him, he is one of the members of the FDA 
Vaccine Advisory Committee. Now he brought up some very excellent points. So far, Paxlovid appears to be working against new subvariants, but when the new variants are escaping some other immune control, Paxlovid will be a single agent at the end, and the likelihood for resistance is just a matter of time here. Now, how to properly use this drug is very important, and the best evidence right now is using it in unvaccinated patients with high risk. But clearly, when more than half of the adults, you know, basically in the whole world, are vaccinated, and many of them are boosted. Pfizer's need to find evidence to sell this drug to both vaccinated and unvaccinated people, or otherwise, the market is pretty small for them. So that is everything that I want to wrap up with the Paxlovid topic. And the second topic I want to talk about here is the potential, you know, possibility of a second booster for all adults here in the U.S. Now, right now, the second booster is recommended to everyone 50 years old and above, and everyone that is immunocompromised. The idea is that these people are at higher risk for severe COVID-19, and the second booster can top off their neutralizing antibodies, so there's a reduced chance of getting COVID. And if you don't get COVID, you don't die from COVID, and that is supported by some evidence, and such as this paper published in The Lancet Infectious Disease. Basically, um, they concluded that the fourth dose okay, uh, of the COVID-19 mRNA booster it can tolerate, it can be well tolerated, and can boost both cellular and humoral immunity. But very specifically, this study was in patients at an average age of 70 years old and ranging from between 50 to upper 70. So do we have data of giving a second booster to people less than 50 years old? Now here is a BMJ summary of a WHO statement. The WHO said that there is some benefit to support a second booster for high-risk groups, but an additional dose for Healthy younger populations is limited, and preliminary data suggests that the benefit is minimal. And the European CDC here is a web page from the European CDC Center. Pretty much, they are saying the same thing. Okay, saying that the early administration of a second booster dose of currently available vaccine in healthcare workers and people working in long-term care facility is likely to only offer limited benefits due to limited and rapid waning protection against infections and transmissions. And at the moment, there is no clear epidemiological evidence to support giving a second booster dose in immunocompetent individuals below 60 years old. So the European guideline actually even have a, a higher cut point. Now the US says 50 and up, okay, the European says 60 and up has a more clear benefit. So there's already some discrepancy between what we are doing in here in the US and as well as what people are doing in Europe. Now I know someone may say that Hey, I am 45 years old and I'm living with a very sick parent who is 75 years old and I'm afraid I may, you know, spread COVID to my parents and I need that second booster, you know, to protect me, protect my parents. Now, the problem is that the fact is that so far there isn't really good evidence that is suggesting uh, how well this vaccine or all of the COVID-19 vaccines work to prevent transmissions and if it does it only goes for a very short period of time so this vaccine so far is more of a personal protection vaccine than a vaccine that can protect the community now, another complication factor for a second booster is that even though this 
you know, authorization could give an options for people that want the maximum protections for all the time. Okay, but the chances are these additional authorizations may lead to some additional mandates, and I wonder how many companies or universities will turn around and make this options becoming a mandate for everyone in their organizations. And again, how much additional benefit can the second booster offer to a healthy young university student? I would like to see some evidence for that, and I hope someone can present that evidence to me. And the last piece of article that I want to share with you all here is an article that was written by a Johns Hopkins professor and an epidemiologist who works for the Florida Department of Health. Now, this is a very intriguing article, and actually, uh, the title says already, you know, someone is not following the science. And that's someone from within certain agencies, and I highly suggest you read it if you get a chance. Now, I want to make it clear that I'm not an anti-vaxer, and in fact, I had three doses of Moderna vaccine all back in 2021, and so far, I don't have any known symptomatic COVID-19 happen to me, even after I've been. Recently exposed to multiple individuals that have confirmed symptomatic COVID nineteen. So I had a theory about that, and I made a video in the past a couple of weeks ago about that. You may want to check that out. And then you may ask me what else I do to try to protect myself. Well, I can tell you that I eat well. I rarely eat out. I always cook home meal, or my wife cooked it for me. Uh, and I sleep well. And I also maintain some moderate amount of exercise, uh, swimming mostly, and as well as do a lot of yard work during the summer and spring. Yeah, a lot. I mean, a lot. Now I know that there are many opinions in this video, which is quite unusual. Now the story was that someone left me a comment saying that my videos are incredibly boring and lack opinions. I want to make it clear that um, YouTube is. A tricky place to give opinion, particularly on this topic, and my opinion sometimes may not speak everyone's mind. That's the fact. Anyhow, I believe my opinions in this video is supported by evidence, and all of the links are in the description box below. And that's all for this week. And if you find my opinions to be reasonable and balanced in this video. Uh, please share, like, and comment. Let me know what you think. And if you like this type of a content and want to watch more, please consider subscribing to the channel. And that is all for this week. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope to see you again next week. And meanwhile, please stay safe, stay healthy, and take care. Bye.